All good. Thumbs up. Uh, great. Welcome. It's tremendous to have you here on the banks of the Columbia River. And we're here to celebrate the work being done to restore the Columbia River Basin. And it's now 50 years ago, 50 years ago, that the Clean Water Act was passed. And there were programs for many of the great bodies of water in the country, but not for the Columbia River. But now we have a program for the Columbia River, and we're going to kick this off uh, with uh, Casey Sixkiller, who represents uh, the director of Region 10 for the Environmental Protection Agency. And uh, we will then have various individuals say a few comments. And of course, we're absolutely spectacularly pleased to have the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, Michael Regan, having come all across the country to join us here in, in Oregon. But first we're going to turn to his expert on Region 10, and so I'm going to turn this over to Casey Sixkiller. Please give him a great welcome. Thank you, Senator. Well, Osio, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I am so excited to be with all of you today, and really excited to welcome my boss, Administrator Regan, to the great Pacific Northwest. I want to also uh, say welcome home to Senator Merkley and Senator Wyden. Thank you for all you do for hosting us here in your great state. And to our tribal leaders, to our state and other local officials, thank you so much for joining us today. We're standing on the shores of the Columbia River, one of our nation's most iconic, most productive, and most important bodies of water. Since time immemorial, communities throughout the Columbia River Basin have relied on the river to support their way of life, to meet their nutritional, economic, cultural, and spiritual needs. Today, we get to highlight the work being done to preserve and protect this vital resource. I'm so thankful that Senator Merkley is here. He has been such a longtime champion of the river and the communities that rely on it. As you all know, Senator Merkley is the author of the Columbia River Restoration Act, which amended the Clean Water Act to specifically call out the risks that toxics pose to communities throughout the Columbia Basin. The law directed the EPA to work in partnership with the states, tribes, industries, and communities to reduce toxins throughout the basin, and importantly, called on us to work specifically with underserved communities who for too long were not at the table to help advocate and support the needs of their communities. After all, the toxic chemicals that enter the water accumulate in the fish and then pose health risks to the people who eat those fish. And here in the Pacific Northwest, people have eaten a lot of fish for a long time. This is such an important issue in our part of the world. Region 10's four states Idaho, Alaska, Oregon, and Washington are home to more than half of the nation's tribes. Native people have always lived off the land and water. The fish and wildlife feed bodies, souls, and cultures. They have always done that, and they always will. And today, the states are doing their parts by setting new water quality standards that recognize this fundamental reality. And with significant funding from Congress, EPA is doing its part by issuing grants to organizations throughout the basin that are doing the hard work of getting toxins out of the river. For me, as the first Native American to be a regional administrator in the EPA, this recognition of risks posed to Native people from toxics speaks volumes about the leadership we have here in the Northwest and the deep commitment by the Biden administration in working together with the tribes to protect treaty resources and strengthen our nation-to-nation -nation relationship. We are so blessed to have partners in, the, in Washington, D.C., like Senator Merkley and Senator Wyden. They are tireless, they are fearless, and they know how to make things happen, and they're going to talk about that today. So with that, thank you so much for joining us here today, and I'm looking forward to talking about some of our grantees. Senator Merkley. Fly over. 
Yeah, we thank uh, some airline for doing a flyover for us today to help us celebrate the 50th anniversary of the 1972 Clean Water Act and, and specifically uh, the, the funding and the grants that are taking place under the, the Columbia River Basin Restoration uh, Program. And uh, my, my father um, really loved the idea of sailing. So uh, when I was uh, about 12, he bought a 19-foot sailboat that was wooden. We pulled it out from the bottom of the Willamette River because they were practically giving it away. And we spent so much time uh, repairing that, that wooden boat. And uh, winter after winter, we'd have to fix all the weak leaks because if those of you who know boats know that if you take wood out of the water, uh, it shrinks. And, uh, and you come out in the spring to start sailing again. It, it, well. Anyway, the point is, we launched from this dock that you see right there hundreds of times. And uh, we'd always sail upriver, so if the wind failed, uh, then we, we, the current would bring us back down. And often we would anchor right here off this pier to go swimming. And um, those experiences in the river and then being so familiar with the river up through the Columbia Gorge and then on up through, uh, through Idaho, um, on into uh, Montana, uh, loops around. It's just uh, when I found out that the major body of water that did not have an act to protect it was the Columbia River, I couldn't believe it. All of Chesapeake Bay, they, they had a program. The Great Lakes, they had a program and so forth. I think six or seven major bodies, Columbia River didn't. And so that was when I started working with, and there's champions here who have worked on this forever. Uh, and um, we started working to try to get this bill passed. And, and um, that meant some cooperation from senators from Idaho and from, from Montana. And it wasn't until 2016 that we finally got the bill authorized. And one of our champions is right over here, Mary Lou, who has worked so, so valiantly for that effort. Thank you so much, Trevor. But you know, in Congress, you have to get something authorized and you have to get it funded. And so we had an authorization, but we didn't have, we didn't have funding. But finally, in fiscal year 2019, we got a million dollars. And in 2020, $1.2 million. And in 2021, $1.5 million. And last year, uh, $2 million. And so uh, uh, that's been steady progress. Uh, in the Senate mark this year, we have $3 million. But I want to tell you about something most of you may know, but it's a big deal. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Act has in it and I'm looking for the number in front of me because it's so big I can never believe it. Six, what's this, 60? 79 million dollars for the cleanup of the Columbia River and the bipartisan Woo! infrastructure. Yay! 79 million dollars. So this is about understanding how did toxins get into the river and where are they and, and how do we get them out? How can we work with the agricultural industry to reduce the amount of toxins going in? Or how can we work with the manufacturing industry? I mean, rivers go such a distance and the Columbia and it goes all the way up into Canada and loops back into Montana one of the most extraordinary things about this this river for somebody who grows up here in Oregon is the Columbia Gorge and it's like you know valleys are made by rivers in gentle slopes and there's the Columbia Gorge with these walls of of, of uh, basalt and uh, massive floods some 14,000 years ago came raging down after the end of, end of the last ice age and tore out uh, that uh, valley in a very unique fashion, giving us all those waterfalls. I used to say, if you see a waterfall on a calendar anywhere in the country, best bet is it was a picture taken here in the Columbia River. And let's think about how tribal communities for these thousands of years uh, have been absolutely, uh, the Columbia River has been so vital uh, to their way of life, their culture, their food. Not far from here, up, up the river, is the Dalles Dam. And uh, I have a picture in my office 
of Celilo Falls, what the river looked like at those cascades, the Celilo Cascades. And at that spot, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, uh, Native American tribes had come to harvest salmon because the incredible amounts of protein that would come, creating great trade routes among the, the native nations uh, stemming from this Columbia River. So there's so much that goes so deep to the heart and soul about uh, this river. And to have a program that will help take the toxins out of it, that is really a big deal. And we're here to celebrate that today. Thank you all for having been part of this effort. Let me introduce a real champion for cleaning up the river and for our environment in general, uh, who has been working on these issues long before I even conceived of the idea of ever running for office, and that's our senior senator, Senator Ron Wyden. Thank you all. We've got a wonderful group of guests, and this has been some week. We passed in the United States Senate the biggest single climate investment in U.S. history. And it's almost exclusively clean energy tax credits, so those are going to be very helpful in our part of the world, and we can talk about that on another occasion. But it is so good to be here today for another exciting part of our efforts. And I will just tell you, uh, Jeff uh, said I'm the state's um, senior United States senator. Don't take all this stuff that seriously because Fritz Hollings was once his state's um, junior senator at the age of 85. So <laughs> don't take this stuff that seriously. But let me just tell you, the biggest test of a senator, of knowing that they really care, and they're going to get results, is their persistence. Because it is so easy. Back in Washington, D.C., bills get introduced, and the amendment to the amendment to the amendment is offered, and people are just kind of bleary-eyed. But the only way you get something done is to have real persistence and to stay at it, and when it looks hopeless, to stay at it again, and we tell you you can't make it happen, continue to stay at it. We're here today for this celebration because my partner in the United States Senate defined persistence on this issue. Please give him a richly deserved shout out for giving us the chance. I can't hear you very well. I'm almost hearing you. All right. Persistence. Okay. I'm just going to make a couple of quick points because Jeff said it well and we're going to have terrific speakers. The reason this is such an incredibly big deal is I only want you to catch one word. The Columbia River is our lifeblood. This is what we depend on for everything for fish, and for the tribes, and for business, and environmental you know, quality. So you hear a lot of rhetoric about what it really means. You know, what we're talking about is keeping toxic pollutants out of the river because those pollutants are bad for fish, they're bad for people, they're bad for all of us in the Pacific Northwest. So that is essentially the excursion Jeff has embarked on. Two other quick points. If you want to hear about the Oregon Way, and my wife says she hears about the Oregon Way so much, she like rolls her eyes if she hears it again. But this is a vintage Oregon Way effort that Jeff Merkley has led. It brings together tribes, it brings together business people, it brings together local officials. Where's the mayor? I saw him there. There's the mayor in one of the box seats, I can tell. Um, but the Oregon Way, you know, when Jeff Merkley was putting together this project, he didn't go out and ask somebody, um, I'm really working on protecting the river. Are you a Democrat who wants to help? He didn't do that. He just said, here's what we got to do. We got to do this. We got to do it quickly 
because time's not on our side. That's why the climate bill was so important, getting out of the Senate. That's why Jeff's work is so important. This is the Oregon way. This is not a theory. It's not some imagined kind of thing some person in politics brought up. This is about bringing people together to get something really important done. Now, we are on the third and apparently final stop of the Michael Regan <laughs> come to Oregon and once again show how EPA is a terrific partner for us. He has been there again and again. When he walked in, I was already bombarding him with some questions about implementation of the bill that the Senate passed, the Clean Energy uh, for America legislation. As usual, he said, absolutely, going to be hands on. I said, you don't know all the details. He said, of course, we're going to get all the details. We're going to bring everybody together and work on it. So for his last stop in Oregon on the Michael Regan Make the Quality of Life in Oregon Better Tour. Give a big round of applause to EPA Administrator, Michael Regan. Thanks, buddy. All right, that's your senator. Well, good morning. I only have one complaint to register. I don't understand why your United States senators are not more enthusiastic. I appreciate you all having me here today. This, is, this has been wonderful. This has been a wonderful, wonderful morning. Thank you, Senator Merkley. Thank you, Senator Wyden, for, for hosting me this morning. You all could not have any better advocates in Washington, D.C. than the gentlemen that are to my right. So hats off to you all. I also... thank the airlines for giving us the opportunity to clear our throats between <laughs> reading these long speeches. Uh, to my colleague Casey Sixkiller, thank you sir for your leadership in Region 10. Uh, you know, I'm just really enthusiastic about the leadership that we have in Region 10 and in this state. To our tribal leaders and our sovereign governmental partners, uh, thank you for your advocacy and your commitment and your, for environmental stewardship. We would not be here today without your efforts. Now, like Senator Wyden, I can't begin this conversation without acknowledging this week's historic passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which will truly be a game changer in addressing some of our nation's most pressing and long-standing climate-related issues. Thanks to the leadership of President Biden, Senator Merkley, Senator Wyden, and their colleagues in the Senate, the Inflation Reduction Act is, is poised to make the single largest investment in combating climate change in United States history. While also, Yay. yes, while also saving American families as much as $500 a year on their energy bills. This bill also advances environmental justice for communities that have been waiting far too long. $60 billion, billion with a B, across the government for environmental justice and equity. Folks, this is truly a game changer. Federal leaders have been trying for years to craft winning climate policy that cuts pollution, creates jobs, and lowers energy costs for families and businesses, and make our country more nationally secure. Finding that balance hasn't been easy, but let me say with the leadership again sitting to my right, the president has been able to get this across the finish line. While doing that, at EPA, we're also celebrating 50 years of progress thanks to the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act was passed nearly 50 years ago, and it has powered transformative change to protect public health and the environment. The Columbia River is one of the many Clean Water Act success stories, which we can both celebrate our progress and look ahead to what we need to do for the next 50 years. The Columbia River Basin, one of North America's largest watersheds, provides critical environmental, economic, and social support to the country's Pacific Northwestern region, and for thousands of years has been a source of sustenance, ceremony, and culture for our tribal communities. Sixteen tribal governments call the Columbia River Basin home, but high levels of PCBs and other pollutants have threatened the health and safety of the people and wildlife in the surrounding areas. Thanks to the leadership of President Biden, 
Vice President Harris, and their colleagues and our colleagues in Congress. As Senator Merkley mentioned, EPA is investing $79 million of the bipartisan infrastructure law funds in the Columbia River Basin Restoration Program for the next five years. Yes. I realize, you know, after traveling the country that we say passing $1.3 trillion bills, $60 billion, a couple of million here and there, people seem to be numb to this significant amount of money. Folks, these are historic investments in our public health and our environment, and it's gotten done under the president's leadership and the leadership of the Senate. This is allowing EPA to invest and our partners to grow the restoration program and will help develop strategies to identify and reduce these harmful toxins, effectively support watershed climate resilience, and ultimately enable communities to safely access water that supports healthy fish and healthy wildlife. There are many groups and sectors across the basin working individually and collaboratively to protect and restore watersheds and improve water quality. So EPA will be awarding $6.9 million in grants to communities, tribal, state, and local governments, and nonprofit organizations to continue this important work. And this is the first of seven grants, totaling nearly $1.8 million that's been awarded just this month. This is a proud day for EPA. This is a proud day for the Columbia River Basin. This is a proud day for the people of Oregon. It's filled with shared optimism, a renewed hope for communities along the Columbia River who've worked so hard to protect and restore this watershed. And this administration and this agency and our partners like Senator Wyden and Senator Merkley are committed to taking decisive action to protect people's health. And that's exactly why we're here. I like to end by saying all people all people deserve the opportunity to lead a healthy life, and a contaminated environment is a detriment to this opportunity. But we will not rest until all of our hopes become a reality. Thank you all. We're now going to turn to uh, three of our tribal uh, leaders to share their, their perspectives. And of course, we know uh, how this river and its tributaries uh, played such a, a key role in the thousands of years of, of tribal history in this region. And um, the three individuals, uh, and I'll, I'll mention all three, and then they'll each come up one after the other. Uh, Kathleen George is on the Tribal Council for the Grand Ronde, and she is also chair of the Oregon Environmental Quality Commission. She'll be followed by Kareen Sams with the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla, and then Asia Dakota, who is Executive Director of the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. Uh, Kathleen George, can you come and, and kick off the conversation? everyone. You know, there's an old saying, everybody always talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. Well, I've worked on toxics reduction efforts to our waters, fishery, and people for almost 20 years. And there were times when I really felt that we, as people who rely on our rivers, were very willing to hold meetings about toxic pollution, but we didn't seem all that interested in doing too much about it. Well, today, we're doing something about it. Today, EPA is announcing seven projects, and as impressive as they are, they are just the beginning of this multi-year, more than $79 million investment in reducing the toxins entering the Columbia Basin waters. Now, our senator mentioned that I am the chairwoman of the Oregon Environmental Quality Commission, and I also serve the people of the Grand Ronde Tribe on Tribal Council. But at the EQC, we work with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality to uh, restore the quality of Oregon's waters. And I'm, I'm proud to say that that work, that important work, is going on strong. But now we're bringing whole new boxes of tools to the table. But today, I think most importantly, I'm a citizen of the Columbia Basin, who this weekend 
caught crab from Oregon estuary waters to feed my family. I'm someone who feeds her family on the crab and the salmon and the trout and the clams and other foods that our generous rivers provide. And today I'm proud that the people of the Columbia Basin are taking real action to restore the river system that has given so much. The need for that restoration is huge. The time is now. Our fish and rivers can't wait. We have built and fed our communities on the riches of our rivers. We have taken from our rivers, but very rarely have we given back. This investment will jumpstart the much needed work of reducing toxic pollution that impacts our waters and everyone who relies on them. My friends, let's get to work. It's now uh, my honor to introduce Kareen Sams of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation Board of Trustees. Kareen. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, I'm honored to be here today. We couldn't ask for better weather. And it's good to be in presence of people who care about our environment and our waters. My name is Corrine Sams, and I'm an elected leader of the Umatilla tribe. And since time immemorial, we were the original inhabitants of these waters and this land. These resources and foods are something that we uphold most in our way of life. This is a a life way for us. We live on a seasonal round. We harvest and gather and hunt our foods to sustain our culture and our heritage. And it was it is with great pleasure and thanks to Senator Merkley and Wyden for getting this into law and for the EPA and Administrator Regan for implementing this. In 1855, we signed a treaty with the United States government that ensured our exclusive fishing rights in our usual and accustomed areas in perpetuity. The health of our water The health of not only the Columbia River, but our tributaries is dependent on our sustainability as indigenous people. Water and fish are of the utmost importance. Chush, water. Wakanish, fish. So for me to be here today and for the Umatilla tribe to hopefully accept some of this funding and to restore our waterways and the health of our fish is incredibly important. We now face consumption rates where we can't consume our, our first foods in a way that we did before, as all of you. And so as stewards of this land, we appreciate your time today and thank you all. And we look forward to continuing to support this effort. Thank you. Excuse me. And it is my pleasure to introduce the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission Executive Direc Director, Asia Dakota. Thank you so much, Kareen, and um, really appreciate the opportunity to be, <clears throat> excuse me, to be here today. Um, uh, my name is Asia Dakota. I am a citizen of the Yakima Nation, and I'm also the executive director for the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, which is the coordinating fishery agency for the Yakima, Umatilla, Warm Springs, and Nez Perce tribes in the states of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. I'd also like to use this opportunity to acknowledge um, Yakima Nation Tribal Council members in attendance, Councilman Takala, Councilman Miller, Councilman Pinkham, and Councilman Hebsa. Thank you for being here. The cultures and subsistence of our tribes are centered on what we call the first foods, as, as Corinne alluded to, including our salmon, our deer, our camas roots, and our huckleberries. At the center of these foods is chush, or water. Our elders, our elders taught us time and time again that water brings life, chushiwa wakishwit. We honor it at all of our ceremonies, open and close every feast with it as a sign of thanksgiving and gratitude to the Creator. 
When our ancestors signed treaties with the United States in 1855, reserving their rights to fish at all usual accustomed areas, the river behind me was clean and cold. As recently as the 1950s, the Columbia River was clean enough that my grandparents could drink directly from, the, from it without worrying about getting sick. Elders who fished at Celilo Falls talk about having a small metal cup on a stream that they would lower into the river to get a drink. Today, fishers wouldn't dare do this, instead relying on bottled water brought in from elsewhere. Unfortunately, the salmon have no choice but to swim in the polluted waters. The lamprey have no choice but to grow and develop in gravel and sediment uh, contaminated by toxic substances. We have been taught to speak for our resources that have no voice. Water is essential and is worth all the sacrifice and effort it takes to make it pure. Clean rivers and streams aren't just a tribal treaty right, they are a human right. Protecting and restoring polluted rivers and streams isn't just a government obligation, it's our obligation as humans. This is how we take care of our first foods and the land and in return, they take care of us. Tribes have been working to address water pollution for decades and fortunately, we have many partners who are committed to this work as well. We are proud to work with the EPA in environmental and protection and restoration efforts. And since 2020, Critvik and the Yakima Nation have partnered on a project funded through EPA's Columbia River Restoration Act to monitor the state of our first foods and toxins. We also work together to increase fish consumption rates and water quality standards to reflect the higher amounts of fish that tribal members eat compared to the general public. The tribes believe that the long-term solution to toxics in the Columbia River isn't keeping people from eating contaminated fish, it's to prevent fish from being contaminated in the first place. The Columbia River Basin Restoration Grant Program continues this partnership between the EPA and tribes. The planned $16 million in bipartisan infrastructure law funding that EPA's plan for the tribes marks a once in a generation opportunity to protect the human and ecosystem health over the next decade. This stable long-term funding for toxics reduction and pollution prevention projects will allow tribal governments to bring our traditional ecological knowledge and contemporary science capacities for the shared benefit of tribal and non-tribal people alike. EPA's commitment to tribal participation helps us ensure the future well-being of our tribal natural resources, health, and economies, as well as foster the capacity of the tribes to meaningfully contribute to the work of restoring the waters of the Columbia Basin, as well as the greater national effort to combat environmental pollutants and toxics. Together, we can successfully preserve, protect, and manage our lands, rivers, and waters and resources. This will benefit all future generations. Again, appreciate the time to be here today, and I'd like to hand this back over to my good friend, Casey Sixkeller. Thank you, Asia. Um, and I know you have to go to a flight, so you go ahead and sneak out if you need to. Um, next, uh, we're here to celebrate, you know, some of the really important toxics reduction work that the EPA is funding thanks to Congress. And I get the pleasure of introducing several of our grantees who are with us today. But first, I want to acknowledge one of EPA Region 10's staff who has worked tirelessly for nearly two decades on the Columbia. For those of you that know her, you know that Mary Lou's brilliance is matched by her kindness. She knows all there is to know about what's going on in the entire basin because she's worked with and befriended just about everyone in the basin. <laughs> Irrigators, shippers, tribal members, nonprofits, and utility execs. She has played a pivotal role in helping EPA recognize that tribal fish consumption rates in the Northwest before they were recognized. <laughs> thus beginning a critical process to reduce toxics in fish and to help fulfill our trust responsibility to the region's tribes. The work we are funding is an outgrowth of Mary Lou's perseverance and relationship building. She brought the right people in to shape EPA's process to fund toxics that reflect the diversity and the geographic breadth of the basin. So Mary Lou, we're here today with grants to announce that you helped us create a path forward. So thank you very much to Mary Lou. <laughs> Senator Merkley, we believe the work we're highlighting today is what you envisioned when you fought so hard 
for the passage of the Columbia River Restoration Act. They not only will reduce toxics, but the work will also support climate resilience for the Columbia River Basin ecosystem by reducing aquatic ecosystem and human health stressors in an environment that is increasingly stressed by severe climate events. It's progress, it's exciting, and the grants are but a down payment on the work we intend to do to protect and preserve the Columbia Basin's communities for many, many more generations. We are awarding seven grants this month, and three of the grantees are with us today. So first, I'd like to hear, I'd like us to hear from uh, uh, Ubaldo Hernandez from Columbia River Keeper, which will receive $125,000 to provide field and online toxic pollution education to 1,200 kindergarten through community college students from diverse communities in the Columbia River Gorge. Please come up and join us and tell us more about your program. Uh, well, thank you very much for this opportunity to share our story. Uh, thank you, Senator Wyden, Merkley, uh, EPA Representative uh, Regan. So it's an honor to be here and speak up uh, on behalf of our communities and our organization, Columbia River Keeper. Uh, Columbia River Keeper is a gr grateful for the second time to be awarded for this grant, which does, which does important work to engage our diverse community in learning the process of restoring and protecting or natural resources. Through Nichols Natural Area, uh, we have the opportunity to reach an extensive range of community in the gorge from kindergarten to youth from the Columbia Gorge Community College. The most essential and meaningful outreach is engaging with our immigrant Latino community, inviting them to participate and providing a sense of ownership and belonging in our community, a community historically ignored by the systems in dominant white society. Through learning the importance of restoring and protecting healthy riparian zone, our Latino immigrant communities find a place where their voices are empowered through their actions when participating in equals natural area activities. Voices that are becoming essential to ensure the necessary victories for a clean and healthy future for generations to come. Through this process, we have the we have had multiple experiences that teach us about the great value of engaging our Latino immigrant communities. Latino parents follow their kids' steps to learning and begin empowered together. Members of our community learning English as a second language, participating in an equals natural area, discovering those new words that help them to transfer the love and wisdom to protect and preserve nuestra madre tierra. I want to say that, ki that with kids, I have some of the most incredible experiences that taught me about pure and powerful wisdom coming from their perspectives. In a classroom, during a presentation, a Latino second grade kid raised his hand and asked me when he looked at me and he asked me if I spoke Spanish. <laughs> I say, si sí, hablo español. And with a big smile, the kid said, I knew it. <laughs> In another occasion, during a presentation, a kid raised his, uh, raised his hand and said, we speak Spanish too. Then I continued my presentation in English and Spanish. Well, what I learned from this, for these experiences is that those kids found their language and culture are essential to learning how to coexist with our Mother Earth. Our voices don't need to change to be heard to create a positive, long-lasting impact. This grant also supports our bilingual radio show and podcast, Conoce tu Colombia. Conoce tu Colombia has been a great resource to reach out our bilingual community to interviews with members of the community that works and participate in advocating to protect our communities from toxic pollutants threats facing the Columbia River and how people can get involved to protect the river and everyone who relies on clean and healthy water. Our next speaker is Amy Pepper. Amy represents the Oregon Association of Clean Water Agencies, Aqua, and the city of Wilsonville. 
Oregon Aqua is a private non-profit organization that serves Oregon wastewater treatments and stormwater management agencies. Amy will discuss the grant to Oregon Aqua that will provide source of assessment for pass and toilets for multi municipal and stormwater systems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to highlight how the Columbia River Association Restoration Act Financial Assistance Program will bolster the efforts of the Oregon Association of Clean Water Agencies to protect our state's lakes, rivers, wetlands, and streams. For 35 years, Aqua and its member wastewater and stormwater agencies have worked with our state and federal partners, environmental organizations, businesses, and our communities to implement proactive and sustainable solutions to Oregon's water resources management challenges. Oregon's investment in wastewater treatment and stormwater management has helped protect and restore our state's waterways like the Columbia River behind us. Advances in treatment technology, investments in green infrastructure, and a focus on pollution prevention has allowed our communities to protect the public health and the environment. However, many of the toxic pollutants pervasive in today's society can't be removed by traditional treatment technologies. Reducing toxic pollutants in water is a priority of, for Aqua members, and we have developed targeted strategies to reduce emerging and persistent toxics like PFAS and phthalates by locating and addressing them at the source. Aqua has a long history of partnering with governments, watershed councils, businesses and environmental organizations to leverage our collective resources in preventing toxic pollution at the source. This EPA Columbia River Basin Restoration Act grant will enable Aqua to build on these partnerships and to take a huge step forward in helping communities to reduce two major classes of chemical toxins, PFAS and phthalates in water. Source reduction is clearly the most effective, affordable, and equitable way of protecting the Columbia River Basin waterways from the impacts of toxics. Treating, controlling, and cleaning up these pollutants after they're generated is incredibly costly and ineffective. So our focus will be to identify PFAS and phthalate sources in Oregon, in the basin, and target strategies for pollution prevention and source control. We plan to address PFAS and phthalates comprehensively by combining grant funds with contributions from our Aqua members and partners. We will actively engage and inform diverse communities on how they can reduce the use of products containing chemicals of concern that end up in sewers and storm drains. We will walk our talk by facilitating the adoption of local government purchasing guidelines that eliminate or reduce the use of PFAS and phthalate containing products. We will invest in targeted wastewater and stormwater monitoring to gain a better understanding of the extent of the PFAS and phthalate pollution and identify industrial and, chemical so and commercial sources of these chemicals. Using our monitoring data and research findings, we will support outreach and technical assistance to industrial and commercial businesses to help them manage their discharges of PFAS and phthalates. To sum it up, Aqua is committed to working proactively and collaborative, collaboratively with the Columbia River Basin Restoration Working Group to reduce the impacts of toxic chemicals identified as priorities in the basin. This EPA grant funding gives our toxic reductions efforts a major boost. Aqua and our member utilities will use the new data and pollution prevention accomplishments developed through this grant as a springboard to pursuing more targeted and extensive toxic reduction work all over Oregon. The results of the project will also provide a template for addressing other classes of emerging toxic pollutants before they become a focus of major future regulation. We're very appreciative of the funding support from EPA to address to advance our toxic reduction strategies, as well as the regional coordination and collaboration opportunities provided by the Columbia Basin Restoration Working Group. We look forward to working with EPA and the multitude of other regional partners to protect the Columbia Basin waterways from the impacts of toxic pollutants. Thank you all, and I am happy to introduce Gail Gooch, and I don't recall the organization, but she will introduce herself.
Thank you, Amy. Um, I'm Gail Goshi, and I'm a, I'm a salmon safe uh, hop farmer from Silverton, Oregon. Our family uh, came to, the, to, to Oregon in 1885. Okay, I'm, I'm honored with just a, a little flyover. That was good. Uh, paternal grandparents planted the first crop of hops in 1904. Uh, this year we'll celebrate 118 years of an annual harvest of hops. Now I have to stop right there to say I realize and I realize most and, and I realize almost every day that we're pretty much the new kids on the block. So thank you, thank you for, for members of the tribe that are here today. But through all those years, over a hundred years, the land and the waters that feed the soil were the foundation to our business, and they still are today and perhaps ever more. In the early 2000s, I realized that I needed a way to connect to new markets for our hops, a need to communicate our work and growing practices on the farm, with this new and inquisitive audience that I had, the craft brewer and the craft brew consumer. As I looked into a salmon safe certification criteria, I found a structure that helped organize and recognize all the good principles of land and water quality protection that we were already doing, but also those that we needed to improve on. We identified for ourselves, and ultimately for certification, how crop selection comes into play. Realizing that, that even though the, the market is asking for the brand new hop, that doesn't mean that we necessarily grow it if, it's, if it requires too much effort, too much input to be able to grow that, that selection. We, we continued to look at cover crops. Um, for, for both um, our gener current generation and, and um, our parents, we would have normally had cover crops that were planted to protect the soils, keep the soils in place uh, during the winter rains. What we then took is to take those cover crops and implement them throughout the season to bring in natural predators, to be able to bring more, more um, more compost to the soil. We looked at stream bank protection and setbacks, really important part to, to salmon safe criteria, to realize that, that we, we, can't be, we can't be farming up to our, our, our stream banks. And, and the fact that we never did, but to be able to have a, a criteria that restricted us from doing that, it made us think. It made us think how important those streams are to us, that they're healthy and they're providing the water for our crop. Enhancing biodiversity. So that means not only in crops, Biodiversity, that means not only in crops, but it also means in, in the, the, the pests that we deal with and the natural predators that we bring into our, our fields to protect and, and combat those. IPM and, and pesticide reduction, it all is about being able to have a, a system that truly does work with the natural cycle of things. And we have reduced our pesticide inputs greatly. Salmon Safe, in, in their criteria, they look for water protection. They look at chemistry that we would be able to legally use on our crops, but we, but we do not with the certification because that chemistry may last a long time in the soil or it may move very quickly through the soil profile. That means we would be jeopardizing our streams. And water conservation. 
my goodness, when we started to look at drip irrigation um, uh, now almost uh, 25 years ago, it was not because we thought that we were going to be under water restrictions in Oregon of all places. We were, we were wanting to do so that, ag so that again we would be able to be able to combat mildews which can be brought on with sprinkler irrigation with simply putting it through a drip tube. So today for 450 acres of hops we have over 30 miles of drip tubing that we manage to be able to precisely apply the water when the plant needs it. If this story would have ended with our family story, in my mind, it wouldn't be a success. Farmers, businesses, su success and environmental impact come with, with one another. Farmers, businesses, and regions need to be joining on. And success is recognized today. In awarding the Salmon Safe grant that is funded by the bipartisan infrastructure law, this work will expand these same water quality protection practices to farmers across the Columbia Basin. Salmon Safe support for Yakima farmers will be expanded and new initiatives into Idaho hop farmers. I'd like to recognize a fellow Salmon Safe farmer from Yakima, Lon Inaba. Lon. <laughs> through, through multiple generations, the Inaba family have grown all kinds of fruits and vegetables in the Yakima Valley. Ron is now in the process of selling not food, not just food to the local Yakima Nation, but a selling a portion. a very important point, Ron, that I've, that Lon, that I've been wanting to make. You're not only selling food to the Yakima Nation, you're selling a portion of your land back to the Yakima Nation. Thank you for that effort. I'm grateful for being included in the gathering. Thank you and congratulations to all of us gathered for recognizing the importance of this continued focus on water quality in this beautiful area we call home. Thank you. Well, boss, I was going to make a joke about having the Blue Angels come through, but they, the Air National Guard did for us. Um, well, I want to, I want to say thanks again for um, everyone coming here today and for our grantees for sharing their stories. We do have time uh, for the media for one or two questions uh, of the senators, the administrator, uh, if anyone does have questions. And if you have five questions, just fire them out from the media and then uh, we'll respond accordingly.
Yes, that's a great question. And I will say based on the resources that we've already seen from the bipartisan infrastructure law, I'm co-chair on uh, uh, extreme heat uh, committee with uh, the Secretary Becerra of HHS and NOAA, we've been providing resources to cooling centers and communities um, you know, over the, the past couple of months. We're excited about the resources in the Inflation Reduction Act because you know, EPA itself will receive billions of dollars focused on enhancing cooling centers, uh, not only across Oregon, but across the United States. We're also piloting a number of projects that will focus specifically on school districts, uh, really focusing on enhancing access to air conditioning for our children as they're learning in, these, uh, in, their, in their schools. So we're excited that we have resources uh, that we're pulling together with multiple agencies, but we're going to get billions of dollars thanks to the leadership of these senators here and the president to really focus on this in a laser fashion. You know, I, at EPA, we're not focused on uh, any regulations. I, I think uh, one of the, the senators mentioned this earlier that we're focused on, uh, you know, a, a carrots versus stick in terms of EPA's responsibilities. But there may be other agencies that are taking a, a regulatory approach, but EPA isn't. Lisa, let me let me take that. Um, as chairman of the Finance Committee, I got the law changed, so for the first time, the insurance companies can reimburse for air conditioning. In other words, <laughs> traditionally, air conditioning wasn't considered health care. We knew that was wrong because if you can't breathe and you're facing all this heat, you're going to be really sick and in a hospital in a hurry. So we got the law changed so the insurance companies can reimburse. Now we've got to see this uh, effort expanded tomorrow. We're going to have the uh, uh, head of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. That will be my first question to her, Chiquita brooks Lashore, the administrator of how to force the insurance companies to do more. They've got the voluntary opportunity. Too many of them aren't using it. Do you want to close this out? Do you want to close this out, Cindy? I just want to close by thanking the Environmental Protection Agency for all the work that it, it does. You know, um, it was uh, back in the 70s uh, that uh, under Richard Nixon, uh, the uh, uh, Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Acts were, were implemented. Uh, we have looked at an, at an arc of endeavor uh, to uh, change our practices over these decades uh, to restore a lot of our, our wilderness and our urban areas, our practices in every realm, and the EPA has been essential for that. One of the things that I have been fighting for is to restore so much of the staff that was gutted over the last four years. And I just want you all to know from the EPA, I'm going to keep carrying that fight as the chair of the subcommittee that controls that or lays out the budget for the EPA in partnership with all you. Let's restore the EPA so it can help us restore America. And thank you all so much for coming out here. Well, thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon.